Hello and welcome to Book Lust. I'm Nancy Pearl. My guests today are Jennifer Habel and Chris Batchelder, whose new book is called Day's Work, and I have to say it was my favorite book of 2023. Jennifer, Chris, thank you so much for joining me today to talk about your book and what you're reading and what you're writing and just a whole bunch of literary, a literary half an hour, that's what we should call call this. So. Thank you for having us. Oh, you're welcome. I have two questions. Um, the first one is, how did you describe the book to your agent, your literary agent, and how did he or she then describe it to the publisher, Norton, the editor at the publisher. How did she sell it? We're, we're both mystified by that, no, because um, I think it I think it was a challenge. Yeah, uh, well, Chris, you I think you first um, wrote to Molly about it. So how did you describe the book? Yeah, so this was complicated by the fact that we were looking for an agent. We were looking for a new agent and trying to acquire um, somebody and attract somebody's interest. So this is what we had to attract people's interest. And it's a tough, difficult book to describe. And it's a difficult um, book to introduce to the marketplace in certain ways um, in terms of its relative plotlessness and in terms of its strange form and its strange subject matter. So um, we were sending it around to some agents and seeing if we could get some in interest. And it's a tough thing because you want to prepare them. You want to prepare the agent for what's coming, but you also don't want to um, just kind of kill it before they see it. You don't want to say, you know, uh, it's, it would be my tendency to say, oh, I know this is super weird. You know, you don't want to kind of set it up like that. So just kind of try to explain that it's a, a uh, you know, pandemic novel and um, a woman who's become obsessed with Herman Melville and, and uh, making her way through the pandemic, trying to uh, take uh, take stock of her own life by sort of taking stock of, of Melville's life. Leave it at that. And we were, we were lucky enough um, to w end up working with Molly Atlas at, at um, CAA now. And she um, and the book was much weirder then than it is now um, in its uh, initial form. She was just really game. Uh, you know, it's a perfect person. Um, to 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 uh, to find to find the book and to work with. She was um, interested in what we were doing, saw saw some potential for how it might change, and was able to um, pitch it to Matt at uh, Matt Wyland at Norton in a way that I don't know what how she did that, but in a way that um, got got Norton on board as well. And she also had a um, couch. She, she had been offered a couch, Herman Melville's couch, so she, she had that to uh, talk to us about. And her father was involved in this, in our, in Day's work in an interesting way. Um, he had commissioned the biography that Elizabeth Hardwick wrote on, on Melville. Um, so she had some personal connections and she was game. I do remember our editor saying that he so well recalled Molly calling him with an impassioned sales pitch. So she worked some sort of magic. I don't know what she said, but we're grateful to her and, and grateful to Norton for taking it on, for sure. Well, I think it's a perfect publisher for, for the book because their, their books are so diverse in the sense of, you know, you don't, you don't, you can't predict like and say, oh, this is gonna be a Norton book, you know, and um, yeah, very interesting. I know I talked about this book a lot. One of the things that I do in and around Seattle and wherever is, uh, you know, do a series of, you know, talking about 10 or 12 books to an, you know, a literacy fundraiser or things like that. And, I, you know, this was a book, usually books are, are pretty easy to describe. I mean, like Chris, you know, the throwback special, you can say a group of men come who are basically strangers to one another, except they get together once a year to reenact. I mean, that's a pretty elevator pitchy kind of thing. And then, but, but when I would talk about, try to talk about day's work, I would say, now when I describe this to you, you're gonna think this is probably the weirdest book that, you know, and, and it doesn't really, 
you know, and you're going to finish it and, you know, many of you are going to love it and many of you are going to go on and read Moby Dick after you finish this book. And then usually there was an audible gasp in the audience from people. <laughs> like, how could I possibly, you know, why would I read Moby Dick? But, and then, and then I say, and you're, it's going to be difficult for you to explain to anyone else why you loved the book so much. And so, you know, and I've heard from people who have said, I mean, two, at, at least two people who are, you know, one a good friend and one my sister, um, you know, both of whom I told about the book, have gone on to read Moby Dick. And, <laughs> you know, I, I don't have my sister's, you know, thumbs up or thumbs down, whatever, but the, the, the man who read it, it was on his list. Moby, Dick, your book and Moby Dick was on his list of the best books of the year. So, <laughs> all right. Now, my second question. Although I think we'll go back to how to talk about this book, maybe. Um, my second question is: th This scene, and this has come from actually that man who 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 loved the book, and and then ended up loving Moby Dick, which he had never read before. He said, why is it called a novel and not a memoir? And you must have gotten that question. So how, how, do, you, how do you deal with that? The origin of the book was uh, me attempting to write uh, poetry about this. So it, it sort of started there, and then um, that was not working. And then Chris and I started working on it together. Um, I thought maybe maybe it's nonfiction, but um, then Chris said, you know, it really seems to be about this voice that you know is is coming into uh, play here, and and that's really sort of fiction. You know, it's 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 a study of this narrator in a way, and actually a lot of the stuff. Well, I, I wouldn't say a lot, but a good portion of the things that are said about the narrator and her husband are actually made up. So I think it has the feel that it's memoir, but actually, for example, um, Chris never went down to the basement to quarantine. So I, you know, the, the couple is based on us, but is not is not the same as us. And I don't think we were really trying to tell an actual truth, I guess, in, in writing it. We, I, I think it tells a kind of a truth, but it's not um, the truth of actuality. It's more the maybe the truth of the spirit of our relationship or something, if that makes sense. We did, you know, have some days of discussing genre, you know, early on, I, I think I was saying this is not poetry. And then um, the nonfiction question did come up is so much quotation. And that's all, uh, that's all, of course, nonfiction and not, not made up. But it just seemed to be, it was a voice and it was Jennifer, but it wasn't quite her. And we were both building that voice together. And it was this narrator's attachment to this material. Uh, that seemed like uh, that made it novelistic in that way. And I think, you know, I think Jen's right. It's a, it, it sort of tells the truth of our, our marriage, but the conversations are made up and much of, the, much of the things that happen in the book are made up. I mean, it's an interesting question if you sit together and have a conversation in the morning and put it in a book. <laughs> in a sense, you've had the conversation, <laughs> you know, like you're making it up. It's artistic. But it, I, I have thought about that. In a sense, we did have these conversations. They were just in the, in the service of the book. So, Jen, you write, you write, you're a poet and y you write, um, among other um, forms of poetry, a form called a cento. And when I, first, I, I'd like you to explain it because you would do it better than I would but I, I was very reminded of those poems of yours when I read Day's work so could you talk about what a cento is? I basically think of it as a poem that's stitched together it uses other people's words and stitches them together to make um, a new a new poem of sorts and I've always been very interested in quotation in in writing and you know as I thought about like how did I get started as a writer uh, really I, I kept a commonplace book where I copied down other people's writing that I loved and um, I really think that was probably the first way in which I was almost practicing to be a writer and uh, I remember in graduate school we had to do a year-long project on just something some some craft element we were interested in and I did quotation, just studying how, how you could use other people's words in your own work. And so 
moving into making those centos that were entirely of other people's words was in some way a culmination of something I'd sort of been practicing and experimenting with for a lot of years. But um, it's hard. You can't just, you, you have to find a way to transform it into something of your own, you know, and, and I, for every one of those centos I've made, I, I think I have 10 that were failed, you know, sometimes using even the same source materials. And um, usually for me, it involved finding a form in some way, like transforming the form of the poem to create something that uh, reflected me in some way. But I think I've just always been in love with the way people sound, you know, when they speak and on the page. And so a lot of day's work is, I think, also has to do with my sort of affection and love for how various people in the book sound and, and trying to bring them into this larger thing. I just think the magic trick of that poem and, and then what we were trying to do in the book, too, is you get the words, the wonderful way that people speak and write. But you also get the, uh, the, the quietly or implicitly behind the scenes, you get a sense of the narrator or the, the person who's manipulating or, or arranging or curating this. So, you know, if, if it's going well, you get that, you get both. You get the wonderful, you get other people, you get the quotation and then you get, um, you know, the, the protagonist underneath it all who's uh, revealing herself, you know, um, kind of subtly by how she arranges this material. Yeah, and one of the biggest struggles in this book was how much the narrator would speak herself. And we really worked and struggled with that proportion and and heard consistently from people that she needed to talk more. So um, that was really our our major revision was was bringing her in more. Um, yeah, I think your your explanation gives me um it makes a little clearer to me why I love this book so much because what what I love when I read are are characters, but it's mostly I think now voice and in the way the language is used, and maybe for me one of the best parts of this book are all the quotations. I think that's what got me thinking about you know your poetry, Jen. The, um, the Robert Hass poem, which, which you, which the narrator um, uses about Melville's son, old oldest son, I believe. Um, I, I mean, that's something that just that I've you know thought about. I too kept a, a commonplace book of quotations, um, which I now because I'm so much older than you all um, but that are falling apart because I've thumbed through them, you know, so long. So are you still, are you still doing that? Keeping, keeping the commonplace book? I do. I, I, not as, um, you know, regularly as I did when I was younger, but I still do that. I have notebooks. Um, and you know, when I was younger, I used to have these beautiful, like art sketchbooks and I, um, had like nicer handwriting and and was much more self-conscious about it. Now it's in these like 69 cent ruled notebooks that are just tossed around the house. But, uh, but yeah, I still do it. I imagine I always will. Yeah. Yeah. I remember copying down, um, I think it's a GK Chesterton poem called Lepanto and it's like pages and pages and pages. And I remember in college, just trying to handwrite, you know, all of that because all we had, I mean, we didn't have, it's much easier with computers, but it's more meaningful when, I think, when you, when you write it. So that was one thing that I thought that the book made me think about um, was that cento and, and, you, and you being a poet, Jen. And then, Chris, one of your, one of my favorite books ever also is the throwback special which, although it's probably have a subject guide, sub, subject heading in Library of Congress or wherever that it's about football, um, I mean, I would describe it as pr pretty much a, a it just, it's a fabulous character-driven novel, and you've made each of the characters in it who, who, are, who are men who come together once a year to reenact a, a football play. You don't have to. You don't have to even know anything about football or like football or love football to love that book. What you have to love is character-driven novels and great writing. 
and that's what that's what Day's work reminded me of too. D did you see? I mean, is that is that the kind of book that you like too? Character driven, with with great writing when you're a reader. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and let me say thank you for those words. That's really really kind of you, and um, means a lot to me. Um, but yeah, the and I had never thought about it before. But this uh, this idea of gathering a lot of people together, which is in the hotel and throwback special, but that's what we've done in day's work too, just gather, you know, through, uh, create a space where these people can gather and, um, and speak to one another. Um, but yeah, I think I've, for me, writing is about, because I'm, I'm probably not going to get involved in projects that are very propulsive at the plot level at, at the, at like causally linked action. You know, I mean, I, I enjoy movies and books like that and, um, wish I had those skills, but I don't. So, um, it's about how can you create dynamism or how can you create energy or propulsion if you don't have it at the level of, of plot and causation, you know? And so uh, it's a tone. I think it's tone and it's um, just careful, precise writing and uh, this interplay of voices, you know, um, in kind of episodic ways. Um, so I hadn't thought too much about the, the connection between the throwback special and, and um, Day's work, but I do think they share. They share certain things. Yeah, I mean, just you both as writers and how that's represented in 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 the way the in the way day's work is played out. I think it just was fascinating <clears throat> to me. Um, so who who's the big Melville fan? Are you? Did you both? Is that something that drew you together? Uh, that keeps your marriage strong? Is this love of Melville of Herman Melville? Um, because I have to say, I myself was assigned Moby Dick in the 10th grade, and, um, and I did not read it. I couldn't, I just found it totally uninteresting. But um, I still got an A in the class, so I feel like I accomplished something. Well, um, you know, in a way, neither of us. I mean, we both had read Moby Dick before writing this book and had read some other Melville. We both, I would say, love uh, Bartleby, have like just, just came into this, just loving Bartleby separately um, and together. Um, but really what happened was I uh, came upon an article um, that was written by Jill Lepore about the composition of, of Moby Dick and um, Melville's time in his farmhouse, Arrowhead. And it highlighted the work that his um, sisters did to help him write Moby Dick and his wife. And I, I became fascinated with that, basically, with um, the, the family that lived with him while he was writing Moby Dick. And we used to live in Western Massachusetts, so I think I was also drawn to this idea because of having lived there and loved that area. So. I actually initially started researching um, the women in Melville's life, his sister Augusta and his wife, and, and thought that I might write something about them. But sort of quickly, I you know just got sort of overtaken by, by reading about Herman Melville and thinking about him. So really, you know, it was, it was the biography of Melville that was the entry point to this project more than uh, a love of his work that preceded this, although, you know, I am a, a great fan of Moby Dick and have gone back and reread it since writing Day's work. And that was, it was a pleasure to just read it. Um, during the writing of Day's work, I avoided reading a lot of Melville's uh, fiction because I thought I would become overwhelmed with the desire to quote his writing and it, it, would, it would just sink everything basically. I'd written, a, written about him a little bit and taught him, I realized, and um, he had been in my life, but if five years ago you had said, you know, in five years, you, you and your you and Jen are going to collaborate on a novel about Herman Melville, it would, it would have seemed the most astonishing thing, right? I'm just, there, it wasn't like our lives were, in, in terms of collaboration, I think our lives were moving that way, but in terms of like... Um, working this working this hard and this long on, on Melville would have been a surprise, I think. Um, Jen got into it. I got into it. The people talk about the Melville vortex. You fall into it. He, he attracts these kind of people through, throughout history, people who kind of lose their lives and their minds to him. So that, that happened to us a bit. But I think we were also just really interested in him as a case study of 
the working artist, you know, and, the, and a case study of somebody who, like, is it worth it? Was it worth it for Melville? He wrote Moby Dick, but he was miserable, and he made a lot of other people miserable. That interested us. We don't have to have the answers, but we were interested in exploring it. And he just became this way for, for us to do that, for our narrator to take stock of her own ambition and her own life by, by, you know, in an outward way by, by, tackling, by tackling Melville. Uh, but yeah, it was a, it was a surprise. Yeah, I, I had I always liked Melville, but I wasn't. Um, and I will say, I think this this kind of cooler approach that we had to him is is good in a way. People really lose their minds about Melville, and they want to defend him and they want to advocate for him, right? Because there's some unsavory things in his life. And I don't think our narrator. I think our narrator is a little bit more distant. She's appraising him. She um, there are things about him she finds tremendously. Uh, wonderful, uh, but there's things she's troubled by. I just don't think Jen or I um, ever felt like, oh, we have to protect him. We have to protect his reputation. One of the things that I was struck by reading the book was, was as you said, how many people like loved Moby Dick. Toni Morrison, for example. You know, I, I wouldn't, for some reason, I, I, maybe because I had not loved the book, enough to finish it. Um, I mean, how could all these people think, how could all these people just absolutely adore this book? And I, I thought too, his friendship with Nathaniel Hawthorne was fascinating. Um, and, and I loved in the book, you know, the way you refer to one of the biographers who certainly fell into the vortex as the biographer, the biographer. Um, you know, my, my, my sister, when I last talked to her, said, well, I don't, who is the biographer? Um, so I had to say it was kind of explained at the back of the book and all of that. Um, do you think you'll go on and do you think you'll ever do another collaboration? Yeah, it's funny that you asked that. We we are experimenting with uh, writing sort of a companion book to Day's work, which is uh, from the husband's perspective, although not dealing with the same exact period of time. And and it's very early stages, so we'll see if it works. But um, it's it's very different than Day's work. It's different formally, and it's not research based. So. Um, but what I, you know, we're sort of thinking of it as like a Mr. and Mrs. Bridge kind of. Oh, thing. I was just gonna say that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so yeah, I think we're gonna keep going and see if we can at least do one more book together. Wow, that's that's well, I I can't wait, and I really want um, all the viewers of Booklust uh, to go to the bookstore, go to the library, and check out Day's work by Chris Batchelder and Jennifer Habel. And Chris and Jen, thank you so much for um, coming by and <laughs> uh, doing this, this Zoom interview. And I hope when you come to Seattle, um, I can show you some of the bookish spots around. That would be lovely to meet you both in person. So thank you. That would be great. Thank you thank so you, much. Nancy. Thank you so much. Real pleasure.